the moment recording comes yes recording has started okay so we can begin now yes yeah. sir yeah uh, a very good morning to everyone it's a pleasure to see such a large number of people joining us this sunday morning uh there has been a little change in our schedule today we had circulated that uh, uh, mr rabind not ready would be speaking to us but he is little unwell so i think the uh, talks are going to be initiated by mr s gopalan who was our speaker last week and then there will be an observation by sri hastanka followed by some remarks by mr rajaram kudli and if possible mr ravidnath reddy if he is present he would also speak for about 5 to 10 minutes and then we'll open it for a general question and answer session so i once again welcome everyone including mr gopalan mr kudli and mr reddy who in spite of his uh, illness is trying to make up and has perhaps come to to our meeting today uh, and the and the theme of our talk today is memory knowledge and inquiry so with these words i welcome once again all the speakers and i would request mr uh, gopalan to please make the opening remarks mr gopalan sir thank you dubedi uh, namaskar to everybody the topic for today which uh, my friend uh, ravindranath reddy had intended to talk about was uh, memory knowledge and inquiry and uh, so let me open this in the way that it is it strikes me most of what i have to say is actually uh, has been discussed by raja ram ravindranath reddy and myself we used to keep meeting here before the lockdown every few days and we have talked about all these things which is why they will also add something to what i say now memory knowledge inquiry all three originate from the brain so the brain becomes the focus of the discussion really krishna murthy has made many statements between 1950s and 1980s he made statements on mutation in the brain and in consciousness he talked about computers and their implication on human living he talked about genetic engineering now krishnamurti was is not an authority on these subjects and he didn't give us some out of the world insights that he had in these areas he used to meet with specialists biologists doctors neuroscientists other scientists and in the discussions with them he got to know what was happening in the world around him and from that he made these observations which came out as statements now those sta these statements have been made 40 to 60 years ago in this period science has moved ahead and has revealed a lot of its discoveries to us krishnamurti was spot on in most of his observations especially the implication of computers on human living but some do some of his statements need to be restated in the light of what we know because as we said krishnamurti is not an authority ultimately we have to be a light unto ourselves so mutation and consciousness and the brain was something that krishnamurti started talking about in the 1960s and he made one critical observation mutation is not a change change implies change towards something whereas a mutation is a complete transformation that happens in the instant it cannot have an end in view towards which you mutate it happens now one of the situations where mutation happens is when the observed is the observer is the observed now this is a intellectual statement which we have endlessly debated 
but the intellectual analysis and debate does not give the experience of the observer being the observed where there is no separation and when you have that experience you can't talk about it while you're in it you can only talk about it when you come out of it so the actual experiencing is what really matters it happens every day when we are in attention when we are in immersed in what we are doing or even when we are in deep sleep when we listen deeply to something this happens now listening is unconscious awareness is it possible to be consciously aware Krishnamurti talked about this in some of his talks when he pointed out that if one can be so aware through the day, then whatever has to be coming out and ch being churned is churned during the day. The mind is quiet. <clears throat> then at night when we are asleep, the unconscious is able to send its communications into the conscious. If we are preoccupied through the day and haven't completed the work of, of our intellect during the day, then that carries over into the night when we sleep as dreams. So he seems to indicate that there is something called conscious awareness. Krishnamurti also talked a lot about meeting death. Now, there is nobody who lives exists in this world who has met death and has returned. Because you can meet death only when the body disintegrates. So at that level, there is nobody who actually has had the experience of it. But there is a way of experiencing death, which is an ending. Is it possible to experience the ending of a desire, the ending of an emotion, the ending of anything, attachment, not intellectually analyze and do it, but can you act, one can actually end it in oneself and observe. That's an experience of very close to death. In science, mutation is the main source of genetic variation. And therefore, in this entire process of natural evolution, mutation is an essential component of it. This mutation can be of two kinds. It can be somatic, which is only inside the body of the person, or it can be a mutation which is hereditary, which is passed on. But both these are only at the level of the physical body. There is insight and mutation can happen to anyone. And uh, here I would like to give you a, an, a live story, which, which is on YouTube. After I finish the talk, I will share the link in YouTube, if you are interested to watch. There was a phys visiting physician that we had here at the Valley School campus. His name is Dr. Shiridi Prasad Tekur. He died last week on the 16th of this month of uh, COVID related complications. This man, 40 years ago, when he was a doctor in the army in Mizoram, he had a, a life changing experience. And uh, in different forums, when they had discussion, he has talked about it. In this particular video, this question was put to him, how does one face death? And he talked about how to do it for about an hour or so. And in the last 10 minutes of the video, he described his life-changing experience and how after that experience, the fear of death disappeared. So that is a living story we have from just a week old. I'll share the link at the end of the talk. Now, Krishnamurti talks about mutation in brain cells. He talks about the fact that the brain cells themselves can change. Now, this is a statement uh, which I think needs to be revisited in the light of what we have now learned in the last 40 years. What is the brain? Brain is an organ of the body made up of cells. All cells in the body are made of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and traces of some minerals. There are differentiated cells and undifferentiated cells. 
these undifferentiated cells are called stem cells and only when the cell is formed is it undifferentiated after that it becomes a special cell whether bone cell or brain cell or whatever cell then it cannot become a common cell anymore but this differentiation is only with respect to the function of the cell the material of the cell is the same and the brain is made up of the same material carbon hydrogen nitrogen oxygen and traces of minerals this brain is therefore common to all human beings there is no such thing as a human brain but the functional aspect of it seems to become specialized in different brains then there have been discoveries about the brain itself uh, scientists have estimated that we use hardly 10% of the capability of the brain scientists have discovered that there is intra brain communication which happens through neurons neurotransmitters and exciters these neurotransmitters and exciters are chemical interferences produced by the body itself but the chemicals can be replicated and this is what we do in the entire treatment of mental illnesses and stress so an example is dopamine and opioids dopamine is a neurotransmitter generated by the body it works in some ways similarly to the way morphine works which comes from the uh, which is the from the plant based source so this implies that the food that we eat affects the brain because the brain is built up of the foods that we eat but there is a second level habits are behavior patterns that are wired so deeply in our brains that we perform automatically without thinking without attention now this allows the human being to follow the same route which is we call neural circuits to work every day without thinking about it with repeated use these pathways become deeper and deeper and as they become deeper they become increasingly difficult to get out therefore lifestyle whether we meet living out of habit or we meet living out of attention and uh, as if it's the first time every time makes an extraordinary difference neurogenesis is the science which talks about the growth of brain cells are neurons produced through life or only at birth now this is a, a debatable subject there are scientists on both sides of the fence but we know for a fact that human beings age as they grow now we also know that the brain has a left brain capability and a right brain capability the left brain is more analytical the right right brain handles emotions and art and music and such areas but this we know that in children both these human hemispheres are plastic the division is not so clear this division becomes rigid and separate as we grow and that is really aging so if you watch how a child learns a language the child learns the language analytically and also emotionally therefore language which is learned very early in life goes in at a different level a language which we try to learn later in life which is mainly the analytical process becomes a, a tremendous effort so is it possible to retain this plasticity of the brain as we grow older is it possible to produce new neural circuits as we age that means can we be aware of habit and because when you are aware of habit there is the possibility of a new neural circuit forming is this what keeps the brain from aging why do we need habit why do we need to do anything automatically is it not only from the standpoint of efficiency multitasking which is actually come to us from the machine world we want a multi a machine to be as efficient as possible but is the human being meant to be a machine 
uh, one can, if one watches somebody who's recovering from a stroke, it's quite an extraordinary revelation. The person, however old he may be, has forgotten what it means, the movements involved in turning the body to one side, in taking the steps for a walk. He has to relearn everything. And because the brain is rigid, not plastic, that relearning is a torturous effect. Krishnamurti talked a lot about computers and their effect on human living. He first talked about this in 1958, when he pointed out that machines are taking over the functions of memory. Now, at that time, there were no PCs. The PC came only around 1980. In the 1960s, you had only mainframe computers, which was available to big industries and research organizations. Then you had microcomputers, which were still in the realm of the business and institutional world. Individuals came directly into contact with computers only after 1980. But Krishnamurti made these predictions right from 1960 onwards. So he pointed out that what that these were computers were going to take over the, the memory of which is what the brain relies on. So would the brains of human beings atrophy? Now, you can actually see that in real life. Capabilities that were taken for granted as part of human beings have today been lost. In the urban setting, you have everybody with a two-wheeler to zip from the house to the shop opposite the house. The practice of walking is being lost. So we have to take the car, drive to a park in the morning, do our four rounds around the park, and then drive back. But for every other activity, we have to walk. We have to take the car. We cannot walk. The moment this lift, the escalator, or the elevator is provided, the natural inclination of the human being is to move towards the elevator and not towards the staircase. So the simple activity of cooking your own meal is getting lost. The younger generation today says, where's the time? We prefer to either get ready to food, food or order from a takeaway. So this, these simple acts is something we are losing. Uh, you probably have heard of Carl Jung, the mystic uh, psychologist of the 19th, 20th century. Jung built a house for himself on the shores of Lake Zurich. He called it Bollingen. And in his, towards the end of his life, he described what he did in that house. The house had no piped water. Water had to be pumped from with a hand pump. There was no electricity. Wood had to be chopped. The fire lit. He had to cook his own meals. And he made this statement, these simple acts make man simple. How difficult it is to be simple. So has the computer taken away these simple acts which kept us alive and made us more and more dependent on technology? Then Krishnamurti pointed out that the, the way of earning a livelihood was going to change completely. Human beings were going to have more idle time and therefore entertainment would increase. And he made a very predictive statement in a talk in Madras around 1980. Those are the only things we have left. Entertainment or deep inquiry into oneself. So it's an either or situation. Either you are in being entertained or you are into inquiry. And uh, let's not deceive ourselves. Even these meetings are one form of an entertainment. Whether the entertainment is religious entertainment or whether the entertainment is really intellectual entertainment, it's still entertainment. Why are we here at these meetings? Primarily because we are not able to stay with ourselves. And this fundamental fact that we are unable to stay with ourselves is the cause of all the restlessness. So does that need any action outside or is it only an action of inward watchfulness? Krishnamurti also talked about uh, genetic engineering 
and at the at his last talk 4th of january 1986 in madras he talked about it very passionately that passion comes through even when you listen to the video recording but for some of us uh, it's a deeper connect because we were there at that talk and you felt the the intensity of what he was saying he was saying genetic engineering on one side and computer on the other when they meet as they are inevitably going to meet what are you as a machine human machine a human being he asked this question it's already happened we have scores of viruses which are the product of the computer meeting genetic engineering all manipulated by some intellect capability behind and it's inevitably a crooked in a, a capability because it always manipulate but in all this talk of genetic engineering one aspect which came after the 90s and therefore did not get addressed was what we now call the field of epigenetics what epigenetics is saying is that dna is not king it is the environment which decides which trait manifest just because those traits are in the dna doesn't mean they manifest so this environment and this is important includes the emotional and the mental state so happy states <clears throat> stress states and unhappy states of mind all bring their own manifestations so what is the place of fear in the environment what is the place of stress is it important to manage fear manage stress so when krishnamurti talked about going to the office from 9 o'clock to 5 o'clock for 50 years of your life you can imagine what that was 40 years ago today it's going to the office or working from home 20 hours a day what does it do to you and what kind of traits mutations illnesses is it going to stimulate from generate from the dna inside so is it surprising that we have more and more serious ailments coming up are they coming from outside they coming from our lifestyle krishna murti repeatedly mentioned in all his talks that memory is stored in brain cells but this is again a statement i think that we need to revisit in the light of discoveries in the last 40 years memory resides in brain cells this has never been questioned the response always has been where else can it be now memory needs to be written in some form uh, ancient man chiseled into stone then writing started images were drawn and when the magnetic media came in uh, magnetic fields were created in which the writing was done on the magnetic field now if something is written it should be possible to locate but so far no evidence has been found of memory recorded in the human brain the internet and the mobile phone have opened up different possibilities the mobile instrument or the internet is simply an instrument which connects it has a certain amount of what is called the random access memory keeps the minimum memory that it needs to run but whatever it needs it downloads from some server outside of it and medium of communication is the internet or the network the mobile network is the brain such an instrument which connects up with the memory stored outside of it is it, is this possible Uh, you have the example of your mobile and google drive when the link for this talk comes to you tomorrow the youtube link what you get is only a link but when you double click on that link the video from youtube opens which is stored somewhere else in some other computer in some other part of the world so is brain also something similar which downloads what it needs from a collective consciousness which has all the memories which then goes to say there is no such thing as an individual memory at all which is what every religious teacher has been pointing out 
This also has other implications. It implies that every act of every sentient creature is somewhere recorded in this collective, whether that person was aware of it or not. In the uh, Hindu mythology, there is the, myth, the mythical person, Chitragupta, the keeper of the records. And he is always visualized as somebody who looks like Ganesha, a scribe with a pen, uh, writing it down. That's the imagery that the human mind has created. But essentially what it's saying is all, every single act is recorded and it is there. Uh, today we talk of the Akashic records. So is it is it just a superstition or is it something that actually happens? Now we also know that memories are discrete, separate records. They are strung together by thought, I. So I am all the memories that I remember from my childhood till today. So it's the stringing together which gives the continuity to the in separate discrete memory. What happens when that I, that continuity is broken? Does that I end with death? This is the greatest fear of the intellect. And therefore the intellect would like to invent a theory of reincarnation. Whether reincarnation actually exists or not, the intellect would like to project such a theory because it gives a, a feeling that I won't die, I'll continue in some form. Now, which comes first, the body or the mind? In the view of science, everything is body. In fact, mind is a recent entrance, entrant into the field. So everything is body. The working of the brain is explained through chemicals, which are neurotransmitters. Mind, thought is all supposed to be only in the brain. Therefore, with the eye, all this must end in death. But in yoga, the body, the human being is not seen this way. The human being is seen as a series of concentric circles. The outermost concentric circle is the physical body, the grossest part of it. That is what decays and dies at the time of death. So it's not that the body dies, but life energy withdraws from that outermost body, withdraws into the next level. And the next layer is the emotional body. So the emotional body continues. And in deeper behind is another level and it goes on in levels like this. The physical body is the one that produces sensations. So without the physical body, there are no sensations. So life as we know it doesn't exist without that. But since we have identified life with sensations and with the gross body, we tend to think that the ending of the gross body is the ending of everything. Whereas if layer, if invention, or I'm sorry, if the energy can collapse back into the subtler layers, it, all, it implies that that sense of I is not only in the body. It is in those emotional layers. It is in the even subtler layers. And it is this I which is holding on to the string of memories which it has selected from the collective consciousness. So that is the string that needs to be cut in the term words of the seers. That string, once that is cut, then... Where is that continuity at any level? Uh, Krishnamurti had two contemporaries who lived at the same time as he did. One was Ramana Maharishi. And the Maharishi's message was just one. The world that you know is the world of your mind. This mind has to be destroyed to understand the underlying truth. And the other one was Sri Aurobindo who kept pointing out that the transcendence of man as the consummation of terrestrial evolution and that an em emergence of an immortal, supramental Gnostic race upon earth was inevitably bound to happen. So this leads on to what all these teachers have advocated. They said, what is important in your life is sadhana. Now, we translate sadhana as effort, but effort is a practice that has a goal as an objective. Is 
Sadhana is something more. Sadhana is actually the attitude of meditation, the attitude of receptivity to some higher silence and peace. And you want to encourage the entry of that, that energy in right through the waking hours. And one can only do that through an awareness of what is coming in the way every moment. So encouragement through lifestyle, avoiding activities that pull one away and satsang, the company of people who are similarly inquiring. This has always been the priority of sadhana. So this is what I wanted to share and uh, now we can move, pass on to Ash, I suppose. Thank you, Mr. Gopalan. Very interesting talk. And I think you have given enough food for thought. I would like to mention that, you know, uh, I mean, really interesting to find out where does this memory sit? We recall from memory and all that. But if you see the, the how the content of the consciousness gets created, you know, before a child is born, the genetic conditioning starts gathering up there. And you know, before he really becomes conscious of things around him, the cultural and social conditioning, conditionings become a part of it. And then as he grows older, he collects all that. Now all this becomes the content of his consciousness. Now if there is no content, what is left there? It's pure awareness. So it's, it's not that we are getting something like iCloud, you know, you bring something on the computer and see what it is. This is really interesting to find out where all these experiences and our knowledge are stored. So it's a very interesting thing to be discussed. I think I'll invite Harshji to say something about it and then we'll go to Mr. Rajaram Kudli. Harsh, Harshji, please. Please unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Very interesting, Gopalanji. I, you raised so many questions. I would love to be there close to you so we could meet regularly and go down many of the pathways that you've opened up for thinking about things. Uh, at, uh, particularly as uh, Dubeji says, I would also find it very interesting. I'll just give you a personal anecdote about where memory is located because recently for coronavirus, just uh, having time on my hands, I thought I would do something new and learn to play uh, a musical instrument, which has never been part of my forte ever. So something new. And I started to play the harmonica, the mouth of it, because it's simple. And then to my intense surprise, as I became aware of this, suddenly whole tunes that I had last heard 40 or 50 years ago, I could suddenly play them. Once I became, began to master the instrument, they would just come out from somewhere. I wouldn't even know. I wouldn't even have to think about it. So they have obviously been stored, not just in my brain because uh, so it is interesting whether there is a kind of collective uh, mind in which memory is held. Maybe there is both. Maybe there's a local store as well and a collective store for memory. Uh, that is, uh, uh, you know, rather like in computer, there is a hard disk, which is long-term store, but there's RAM, so the memory gets called up from the hard disk and into the RAM. It's not immediately available. And then once it's in RAM, then it's immediately usable. <laughs> so it may work like that. But anyway, this is, uh, but I was thinking that uh, I was, so uh, that I have to, uh, excuse me a moment. My nephew is uh, leaving for Russia this very minute. So I'll just say goodbye to him and I'll continue if you will. Yes. Yeah. Bye-bye.
Sorry, sorry about that. I won't see him for a month or so, so I thought I should say goodbye. Anyway, uh, so, but then I thought, why are we talking about this? Why are these words, memory, knowledge, and inquiry? And there's a lot to be said about it. Uh, certainly, I've been very interested in this. I could go on for hours about memory, knowledge, inquiry. But then I thought that every time you speak, there is not just the word, but there is also the context, framework in which you are speaking, the situation, the location in which you are speaking this word. And because you know you can take any other word like love, it depends on what context we are using the word love. We might use it to mean different things. So. Uh, I think it's important, this is the context I'm speaking at the moment, is in the context of Krishnamurti's teachings with a group who are interested in that. So I will try and see what is relevant for that. And the other thing that is always with a, a word is the subtext, the context and the subtext. The subtext is what lies beneath the word, behind the word. Why, what, and once again, in this context, the subtext is what is the connection for all of these things to the main concern of the teachings and I hopefully of this group, which is the transformation of consciousness. So in the context of the teachings and with the recognition that we are talking about uh, always in some way about the transformation of consciousness as Gopalanji was as well. So I will try and focus and keep restrict myself and not talk too much about uh, other avenues about this. So about memory, I think enough has been said. And I think the important thing is that there is a lot there in memory that we don't even know is there. And the, the distinction is made between retention and recall. We retain things in our memory. It gets stored there like computers. And then it has to be recalled. Now it's the recall process that is the more difficult process in that we can only recall little bits at a time. And also when we say we forget, we don't often it's, we mean we don't recall. It may be there in our mind and somebody, and things can trigger that memory. Anything, sometimes smells, people say smells, will bring back feelings that you had as a child. You smell some food that your mother cooked uh, long ago and somebody else looks like that and then suddenly remind you and memories of your childhood. So the, my purpose in saying this is that there's a lot more memory around than we are normally aware of or conscious of. It's just waiting to be recalled. Then there is also, and but that memory affects us in our daily actions unconsciously. Maybe it's we can call this the unconscious. It's just not there immediately apparent. So the same thing with thought. We are generally, a lot of the time when we talk about thought, we mean the thought, the surface thought process, which is accessible all the time. You know, I can always tell what I'm thinking if I focus on it. And if I try to be a little bit more aware, I can be aware of quite a bit of uh, feelings and thoughts and images that are running through my mind and, and so on. So there is this ongoing process all the time, which I can be a little aware of or a lot. But there is a whole functioning of thought, which is really very deep, which 
already predetermines the, the way we look at things and the way we even recognize things, even before it has come to our awareness, our brain has already shaped it in a way that uh, conforms to what we've seen before. So to become aware of that process is very challenging. Now, uh, and it requires a lot of inquiry. I hope sometime, if, if we can, if you guys will give me the time uh, to actually demonstrate this for you, to demonstrate how the mind and the brain already configures things long before it has come into your awareness. So you see something to be true, but it's actually been modified by your memory. So uh, I, anyway, so this is one thing about a memory that I wanted to point out and thinking. And knowledge also is somewhat similar, but I think that's, I'm always talking in terms of inquiry, really, but that is, seems to be the focus of this whole thing. It's the last word, but probably the most important word. That we, how does knowledge uh, come into this? Now, the thing with knowledge is, if you look at the history of knowledge, we see that something quite remarkable happens in the development of man. Firstly, human beings are capable of storing their knowledge and then passing it on to the next generation in a compact form. And that's, in fact, some people say that is one of the things that distinguishes humans from, uh, from animals, say, who are very limited in their capacity to store knowledge and use it and then it's more immediate. And you can even see it in uneducated people or people who are, uh, haven't had that much exposure uh, to modern thinking, who live in remote places, that they don't store that much in their brains. Uh, they don't, uh, maybe they do, maybe everything is stored, but they don't recall it and that that is part of knowledge and what we have done especially in the last four or five hundred years we have learned how to create a system of knowledge accumulating knowledge that all interconnects and everything interconnected reinforces each other so we have scientific knowledge a great body of scientific knowledge or even knowledge about, I don't know, agricultural know-how, if you like, how to build things, how to make things, a huge amount of knowledge, and it all is interconnected. Everything supports everything else. My knowledge of science supports the knowledge of how to build things. My knowledge of uh, the seasons, which is, and, and this knowledge is always increasing massively. That helps me to grow things. So we are set up an interconnected, self-supporting body of knowledge. And this is well on its way, especially with the internet, to become universal. So there is a body of human knowledge. Now, one of the problems with having a body of human knowledge is that everything new or that we come upon consciously or unconsciously, we are always trying to fit it into this body of knowledge. That we want to see it in terms of, I don't know, we see something, some event occurring, and we think, oh, we must find a scientific explanation for it. Or we must find a rational explanation for it. Or, I mean, there are people who will believe in revealed knowledge, that the gods reveal knowledge. I'm not judging this or saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying well, also believe in revealed knowledge. And they try and understand the world around them in terms of this revealed knowledge. And they ask questions why? Why has this virus, you know, why has 
this happened to us? Are we being punished? Are we being, you know, and so on. This is, uh, so this is important for us to uh, understand because knowledge contributes, of course, to tradition and to a fixed state of mind, which we then feel uncomfortable if we see anything new or anything fresh. We tend to want to look at it through the framework of this, of what we know already, and what the framework of human knowledge that is already there. So this is, now this in a sense, against inquiry, because by its very definition, inquiry is into something that we don't know about. That's why we are inquiring. We don't know something. And here again, it may be known by somebody else. So our first point of inquiry is to see if somebody else knows about it. You know, for a scientist, this is called research. He does research to see, searches to see, has somebody else written something about this particular phenomenon? Uh, whether we are looking at human relationships, we want to know whether other people have encountered similar situations when we are, uh, say, having difficulty in relationship or something like that. So, this is our first impulse when we inquire is to find out what. But I think what Krishnaji is doing is pushing us to that point where we don't know, where we actually don't know, where nobody knows, where somebody else's explanation is not necessarily going to help me because it is something that I'm faced with and that I have to discover for myself. So this to me is the most important element of inquiry, that we need to push our inquiry to that limit, to that edge of knowledge, where because knowledge is always limited. I think everyone recognizes that and it's always growing. Uh, so, we need to push to the edge of knowledge and begin to look at that area that is unknown to us. And we may find ourselves in the area which is, which we can observe, which we can perceive, but which can't be converted into knowledge because it's too vast and too complex to put it into words or images, or be captured by thought. Now, so I think when Krishnamurti is talking about inquiry, he is talking about this level, this extreme point of inquiry. And it's something that once we find the challenge of it, and we want to meet the challenge of it, and we want to rise the challenge of it, then this is an inquiry that has to happen in every moment of our life. To have a mind that is open to the new, that is looking to see, uh, and is not be tied back, tied down by tradition, by knowledge, by, by any of that. And that is the quality of mind that I think uh, is required and Krishnaji is wanting us to cultivate. So I think uh, that is probably enough for me to say. Yes. Thank you, Arjun. Thanks a lot. I think before I uh, request uh, Mr. Raja Ram Kudli, I would request Harshadji to say something he wants to uh, make some observations. Harshadji, please unmute yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Are you able to hear my voice? Yes. yes. Okay. 
uh, about the memory, I had met one person called Pandit Gopi Krishna, and uh, he has written many books from his own experiences about Kundalini. And um, after many years of this uh, experience, he began to he began to write poems. Uh, he did not make any effort, but the poems came to him in languages which he did not know, which, which he had not learned. So it seems like human brain or mind is in contact with many, many things which we have not experienced personally. And uh, one book which I read by Dr. Brian Weiss, uh, its title is Many Lives, Many Masters. And in that, uh, when this doctor uh, was treating one patient, one lady, and the doctor tried many traditional methods of psychology, psychiatry, but it did not help. Then this doctor put this lady on hypnosis and so many memories <coughs> begin to come from this lady as if she was describing the previous lives and she was also telling which place, which year this was coming from. So there is so much stored in our brain or somewhere, which we are not in touch with, but sometimes uh, people can get in touch with. And about the mutation, I feel that there is this energy which goes to the brain and the brain, some changes, maybe uh, structural changes happen or quality of the brain and it affects, it affects the way we look at everything. And um, that energy, either it, we can call it whatever name, but uh, I'm speaking from my own experience that the brain becomes very highly vibrant and one looks in a different way than one look before this thing happened. So there, there are mysteries, like even when Krishnaji was going into some process, a different voice was coming, the voice of the child, and uh, he seemed to be in contact with some masters, and he was saying something like, they are coming, when Krishna will come back, so there are lots of mysteries as far as the mind is concerned. The brain, we, one scientist can investigate because it is a matter and it can be investigated, but the mind is a real mystery. And uh, the mind cannot be understood by the scientist, uh, because in understanding the mind, there is no distinction between the subject and the object. So when a person wants to look at his own mind, the mind is the subject and the mind is the object. And uh, so uh, it cannot be studied. The mind cannot be studied scientifically. That is what I'm trying to say. Okay, I have finished. Thank you. Thank you, Shabai. Uh, yeah. Mr. Kudli, would you like to say something, sir? Please unmute yourself. Uh, yes. yes. <laughs> you can switch on video also. Am, Am I audible? audible? Really? Your voice is echoing. Oh. Am I audible? 
Is it better? Yes, you are audible. Yes, sure. Okay. Uh, is it still like going? Uh, yeah, there is also a echo in your voice. Hmm. So this is the new system. Yeah, yeah. Is it okay if I continue like this? There is no other. Uh, I don't see any other control. Sir, voice is not clear. Sir, voice is not clear. Voice is not clear. Some problem at your end. Is it okay? Say like that. Yes, what is it? Okay. So, uh, listening to the uh, uh, talks by Gopal and Sir and uh, Harshji and uh, uh, Harshal Sir, some key points I, I, I thought I should mention is that what is the purpose of inquiry seems to be one concern. If accumulation of knowledge or Organizing knowledge, it seems to be uh, inevitable. It's a, it's a habit of the human now, you know, uh, uh, nature or uh, almost the way the modern human life is progressing. Organizing knowledge seems to be uh, inevitable. And with organizing knowledge and organizations to manage the knowledge, dispense the knowledge, all the corruption of organization also seems to be inevitable. Then there is this question of uh, you know, religious inquiry versus scientific inquiry. And to me, it looks like any kind of inquiry into discovering something unknown is of the quality of uh, uh, the mind which uh, this has been seeing. Uh, just now what we heard from Harshad sir, uh, we have all heard many, many artists, performing artists, musicians, scientists saying that I didn't know where it came from. Whenever there is a discovery, whenever there is a creation of a new uh, music or new art, new performance, they say, I, know, I also don't know where it came from. Many words are said that. There are a lot of living legends who say that. As an indication, similarly with uh, you know, scientific and mathematical uh, discoveries like uh, Raman, Jan, and, and so on and so forth, even Einstein and so on and so forth, that's a quality of mind which was just inquisitive into some observed phenomena. And there is a relation. So such discoveries or revelations have occurred to only those minds which had that quality of inquiry without any self-interest. But then immediately the nature of the mind, human mind is so, write it down, publish it, make it into an organized body of knowledge and then there is a need to convert that into something useful. So inquiring into this phenomena as a scientist and researcher and artist and I got into that, I found in some Buddhist literature, uh, now it seems uh, it is so obvious uh, thing that the cave man or the predecessor of man, there, is this, uh, there was this always, uh, you know, the survival instinct. So you are always looking, uh, you know, inquiring into what is causing the discomfort or what are the dangers posed to his survival in the immediate environment. It could be poisonous, poisonous creatures, uh, it could be uh, you know, impossible terrain. It could be uh, seasons like uh, rain and uh, you know the winter, the cold uh, and uh, sunshine and so on. By experimenting with whatever was available that could increase his comfort or uh, reduce the insecurity or increase the chances of survival, he discovered some knowledge about the nature, passed it on to his next generation. He was also able to convert that knowledge into some inventions, covering his body building a, a, a building, you know, protecting his uh, family and so on. Now, by the evolutionary theory itself, whatever gets used grows. So with, uh, with uh, you know, uh, good results he was getting out of this phenomenon of uh, observing, making deductions, remembering, making knowledge out of that, experimenting with uh, nature to increase his chances of survival, chances of, uh, you know, uh, not dying uh, accidentally or uh, in, a, in a painful way by poisonous creatures or uh, wild creatures or uh, by the you know fury of nature, 
with more and more usage and successful usage of this memory, thinking, projection, and converting that knowledge into something useful that will help him survive better. This, these faculties have to grow. That is the nature of, uh, you know, uh, revolution. Now, at some point of time, it has grown out of proportion. You know, that, that making knowledge out of observing nature, making things out of that which will increase the comfort. The question of survival has been taken care of long, long ago. But then this movement of the mind to go on discovering, inventing, converting that into something, and then there is competition, and then there is greed. So somewhere it has taken that, uh, you know, it has crossed the threshold, or it has uh, taken a turn towards, you know, that momentum just working for the sake of its own nature. Go on discovering, go on inventing, go on creating, go on selling to increase the chances of survival. Today, none of those, uh, you know, most of the reasons for uh, insecurity are not there. Or because of this uncontrolled movement of the mind, the way it is working, we have created, the, the mankind has created artificial divisions where a large section of masses are actually driven back to that level of insecurity, as we are right now seeing, you know, uh, the survival itself is seriously in question. So, therefore, the central question to me, which is not easily resolvable, is what is the purpose of this? Yes, sir. 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 Yes, sir.
uh, I am very sorry to use the word wisdom because Krishna avoided it. Uh, wisdom is a loaded word just like God. Krishna talked of intelligence and uh, this, and he said, of course, he said that that intelligence is, is the only security. But he also clarified that that security is not of the self. And that is how, why in one of the uh, student talks at Rishivari, when a student cornered him, challenged him, Krishnaji, you have never lived in India. The morality and the integrity you are talking about uh, stand, stand like a rock, stand like a rock in the midstream. If you do that, you can't survive in India. Krishnaji said, why not? He said, you will die. And Krishna quipped, I will die. You fine. I will die, but life will go on. I remember after I heard it, for days together, I kept reflecting on it. What is the good of life going on for eternity? or for billion years, I mean, five uh, billion years, I suppose, that is the uh, amount of gas, uh, hydrogen gas in the sun. So what is the good of that if I am no more, but, and still I'm left with that question, but life will go on. So that security is not of the self. So, and at another point, uh, uh, Gopalan sir said that, uh, so there is nothing like individual cons uh, memory. It is collective memory or collective consciousness. In one of uh, Brockwood Park talks, and with Krishnaji repeated at Rasgat, I remember very uh, clearly in the 80s, he said, and some of you who have read it may recall this. He said, scientists were making experiments on rats in England, and they were horrified to see that the behavior of rats in the USA lab was changing. So it doesn't mean that we can deny the memory of those particular rats under experiment. There is no, there is no big deal. The only thing is that, yes, there is individual memory, of course. But that memory is also linked to some collective memory. And again, that collective memory is also linked, maybe linked to some cosmic consciousness, which is nothing but pure emptiness. But to me, they are irrelevant. Why? Because that is all academic. So I will only focus on the last thing, which I think everybody has missed. And that is where Gopalan sir's whole exposition terminated at. When he said, whether it be Krishnamurti or Raman or Arvind, if you consider all that together, ultimately it boils down to one thing, a life of sadhana. And sadhana, he equated with effort. All some people call practice. Uh, I beg to disagree with Gopalan sir, uh, but uh, that is uh, I beg to disagree. Not you know because it gives me a lot of kick. You know I I get high not because of that, because probably it is linked to our transformation. Inquiry or sadhana is not, not effort. It is a question of attitude. And let me please allow me to, when Richard Alpert came from Harvard and he questioned Neem Karoli Baba, why do you insist that I should clean the floor and toilet and this and that? I do that in America. He said, yes, but that is a self-centered activity. Have you noticed some change? So yes, when I do this, I remember it is an act of love. He said, yeah, that's it. And that is Seva. So, you can do the same thing. It is a question of attitude. Now, can like, I mean, uh, since I have hardly any savings and I have no pension, I have to keep teaching. But is it possible that teaching is not a means of my livelihood, but teaching is my sadhana, so to say. I, I, I say, so to say. Teaching is my joy. Teaching is my way of teaching is the very breath that I breathe in and breathe out like that. So basically sadhana, it is a question of direction. All our life we have been going towards north 
and we can still continue to go north to the outside world. We will still be looking after our family and all that. But then I know in my heart of hearts that I'm not going to north, I'm going to south, which is the area of not knowing. And to, to, to say only once to oneself that I don't know. And probably the next thing I can say, and the only next thing I wish I knew. And let these two questions keep burning all my life. And probably that is sadhana. There is nothing a question of any practice or any inquiry or anything. Thank you, sir. Good morning, sir. <laughs> I hope I am audible and all. Uh, yes, it's a very interesting uh, talk. And uh, in one go, you know, with such a good flow, you have <laughs> uh, brought home a lot of points. Uh, actually, I just would like to add a few points, sir. Uh, I think uh, the teaching and uh, Krishnamurti's books, you know, they all touch at uh, different states of life and uh, maybe at different states of mind, uh, you know. And uh, whatever your intention may be, whatever your direction may be, but as long as it is there, it is it, we are connected with it. I think uh, uh, with that, whatever that is inquiry is there in your mind, it will uh, come to its natural conclusion one day. Because uh, the force with which you want to pursue your inquiry, uh, I feel that is the uh, secret of it. These are all my perceptions, sir. Uh, I just would like to say, uh, like when you are when you said about uh, simplicity, simple living and all. Uh, so I just would like to say, it is the simplicity of the being also counts, sir. Uh, like you know, that's what he says most often. You know, he says, "Be simple, sir." You know. So, like I'm a, like I consider myself a very simple human being, and uh, I have only concern for my daughters and my family. You know, the well-being uh, that is the love I have for them, and uh, uh, I, I don't have any problem in worshiping any god or finding security in that, uh, because I, I, for me the theories and uh, whatever the principles they don't count. It's love, you know. In the same way, love of the teaching, you know, maybe. What is he saying, you know, love for K himself, maybe, you know, what is he saying, you know, what, what does he want to communicate with, uh, with us, you know, that kind of inquiry was figured, uh, you know, uh, long time back. And um, I can make out that, you know, it's understanding oneself. It, it, it's only reading your book of your own life that is there. Uh, so in understanding oneself, I feel that is a, his entire trust is on uh, thought structure how thought at the different stages, you know, how it is, uh, it, uh, it, it uh, empowers us, you know, uh, and it, it is able to ability to see the thought structure and not getting fallen into the, tra the trap of the thought. Uh, I feel uh, that, that is the essence the teaching is pointing out to. Oh, my, my experience is very limited. And the uh, only thing is my only, you know, I can say that, you know, I'm passionate about finding out that's all. Uh, so, so it's understanding oneself and uh, in uh, an ego, you know, the self-centered activity, the egoist activities are the problem which, uh, which don't allow anybody to, you know, go further. And uh, once one, one is able to see all that in its slightest and subtlest ways, maybe things start falling in their place. Uh, I just would like to add uh, this, one bit this much. Otherwise, it's a uh, wonderful listening to you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Gopalan, sir, I would like to ask, uh, kindly elaborate, what is the exact inquiry and what you are finally you are suggesting? Uh, actually, uh, Harish ji misunderstood what I said. I ended with sadhana, emphasizing that sadhana is not effort, that it's a state of receptivity where you are open to intimations that come from deeper levels. But everything that we do consciously from the intellect works against that. So the only thing we can really do is keep being aware constantly how the intellect comes in the way. 
which is what I talked about last time when I said, does intellect continuously obscure the insight, which is the very dimension quality of that living energy, which is always a part of us. So what is the final inquiry, sir? And what, uh, what are your suggestions? I am nobody to give suggestions. I am only asking, can I be aware of this constant in, uh, interference by thought intellect? Now, what benefit will I get from it? That's a commercial question which comes from the intellect role. So why does everything have to have this commercial dimension to it? Can I just ask, why is this thought interfering all the time? Because it is preventing me from understanding or living with that state where it is the thought is quiet. Thank you. I think we'll hear Harshji now. He has a question and then we'll go to Mr. Pradeep Verma. Yeah, Harshji, sir. I wanted to respond to Harishwarji. Uh, as a fellow teacher, I taught at Brockwood for many, many years. And a couple of things during that time that Krishnaji said were very important to my whole approach to teaching. So I'll offer them to you. Uh, one was he said about Brockwood. Brockwood is a place for learning, learning the art of questioning, the art of exploring, which is what we are talking about just now. It is a place which must demand the awakening of that intelligence that comes with compassion and love. So as a teacher at Brockwood, this is what he was asking me to do. Directly, not just something I read in a book, sitting there with him. He was saying this is, and I taught mathematics. And this is what he said about mathematics. He said, in the mathematics class, your main concern is not mathematics, that you would teach. <clears throat> Your main concern is the awakening of intelligence. So this has to go along side by side, even as you are teaching the mathematics. You are alert to that possibility. You're inquiring, you're looking, you're seeing how to awaken intelligence. And that is what I try to do in my years there. Thank you, Arjun. Thanks a lot. Uh, Mr. Varma, please. Yes. Is, am I audible, sir? Yes, you are. Yes. Am I audible? Yes. Yes, yes. yes, sir, you are. My question is to Gopalan, sir. He talked about he talked about epigenetics, the latest wherein it says that environment is solely important, more important than DNA, nucleic acid. So I always thought about it in my research career. Environment has to be very important because all the signals, the life has to survive and the signals, it is dependent on the whole. So this is a holistic way of looking at it that signals come from the environment through membranes and all that. So this is the work by uh, uh, Bruce H. Lipton, Lipton's work. And interestingly, the main question is, Krishnamurti never gave a very respectable position to belief. And Lipton's book says, the biology of belief. This was the book he became famous with. So the biology of belief means the belief system has a strong enough role to change the biology and the genes. So our conditioning based on our earlier belief system, whatever it is, shows that it is in some sort of prominence in us that keeps on disturbing my perception, my listening in everything. It's an impediment. So biology of belief. So somewhere positivity, what people today talk of conscious evolution, 
So something, something whether through belief, one can mutate, one can change the brain cells through belief system. That is what first question is. And that is all I think if it is clarified to me, the role of belief, which has been negated all through, Uh, Varma ji, what I would only like to ask is, belief is something communicated to us through knowledge. When you start inquiring into that belief, are you following the belief anymore? So, can the belief be a starting point for inquiry? And ultimately, it's inquiry which brings in the insight, not the belief. The belief was only a starting point. The belief may be correct, it may be modified, it may be wrong. That's a matter of detail. We're not interested in that. So why should we negate a belief? We negate anything which says accept without inquiry. When you inquire, then the, it's at that moment, it's a living reality to you. You don't need uh, anybody's statement about it anymore. Isn't that perception? Yes, yes, it is okay. But the role, whether belief, whether belief can alter biology, that is my moot question. Any type of belief. Yeah. Enquiry can alter. The starting point for the enquiry can be a belief. Belief by itself is not going to alter. But can the belief be a starting point for enquiry? Do we have to say that all memories are stored in the brain because Krishnamurti said the brain cells carry memory. Or can we listen to that, understand that that was the scientific understanding 40 years ago. Today the understanding is that memory can be stored outside. It's possible. We don't have to believe anything. We just have to keep living in inquiry. That's my suggestion. Inquiry, inquiry is okay. But what about Suppose I want to change, I want to change these brain cells to start with, with some, some, something very positive, suggestions, positive suggestions, yeah. right? Yeah. Which may have a basis somewhere in belief system, as yeah. I believe that environment must be important, which was proved much later on. So likewise, what you call belief or insight, something tells you that this must be happening which may not have an authentic uh, experimental proof, but you do believe, you do believe something which comes from nowhere and ultimately it is proved. So likewise, some positivity, so-called positive, so-called positive, rather transforming, desired transformation for the new society as a belief system or rather as a something can be induced to change to, to, uh, to do that transformation in individual, of course, to start with. Can I put it this way, Varmaji? Uh, you are on a journey, you discover something, and you put a signpost for the person who's going to come behind you. That signpost is the belief. But over time, the wind and the weather, um, the, all the environment, turns the signpost in different directions. So there's no assurance it is pointing in the way that you intended to be pointed out. But you put a marker that, look, this needs to be a, something that you need to very validate. So if you validate every belief through inquiry, which means also understanding how this person came upon this belief, what was his experience? You have to recreate that story. Only then... Does the belief open itself out and then it, it's no more a belief, it's your discovery. So it's discovery, discovery, discovery all the time. The belief is the starting point. It's a signpost. That's how, it, how you would look at it. Practically, practically, conditioned person, no, it's not easy for a conditioned person like DNA. 
DNA was considered the sole thing for decades. Yes. Then, so this will not allow you to question it, right? So likewise, this belief system is definitely a blockade for things to see fresh. So likewise, uh, when it becomes belief, which is practical, when it becomes belief, which is practical. Why should any belief be practical? See, when you say it's important to be a light unto oneself, it means I don't sit and categorize beliefs as important or minor. Every statement is a starting point, but I need, it's my life, my living. I need to take the responsibility of my understanding for that. Why take on something? It's, you see, it's a shortcut. I don't want to take the trouble of investigating. So I'll accept whatever you say, right? Uh, then you have started on to the journey of following. So there can't be selective following and selective <laughs> belief. I think inquiry means inquire all the time, every minute. How do I even know, know that I have another minute left? So I have to inquire every minute. Things very rightly said. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Some other day. Yes. Yes. Do we have any questions? In case we don't, I think Jan Sab, we can close it now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, sir. Time is already over. 12.29. Uh, Mr. Mr. Dubey, if you don't mind, we had said that uh, today's talk was by Sri Ravindranath Reddy and we would give him a chance to add oh, something if he'd like to. Can he at least have the last voice? Sure, <laughs> sure. sure. I don't see his name in the list oh, of participants. His name is given as Ravi on the screen. Oh, okay, okay. So, most welcome. Uh, Where is he? Let, let me unmute him. Youngest, youngest photo is there. His name is Ravi. Youngest photo is there. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. I sorry. I I couldn't take your name. That's it's all right, sir. That's not written right, fully, so. Namaste and, uh, I'm, I'm happy you you are able to be with us in spite of your illness. So go ahead and take as much time as you can. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, okay. There's nothing much to say now. Quite a bit. Has been said. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. And um, well, um, when I get back, I was telling the community that um, an inquiry, which is what we are interested in life, uh, based on our experiences, all the you know, all the hardships one goes through, and all that. So one goes into inquiry and, but then this inquiry is dependent on either a teacher or a seer or some knowledge. And uh, so anyway, at one point for me, after having met Krishnaji, though it is definitely there, uh, uh, others have also said it that knowledge seems to be a hindrance to inquiry. So I was thinking that just about what uh, uh, everything we know. In fact, if, is it that our very existence is knowledge? So that if you take the word I, does it stem from knowledge? I think we all can logically agree to that. So this is the whole uh, thing that was uh, interesting for me to find out. Is there something, is there an approach to the inquiry, of course, most of it would still be knowledge, but is there an approach or a side of which one is could be aware, alert, uh, which may be knowledge, but which need not be uh, knowledge uh, in its entirety. So that was the interest and um, like uh, I think Mr. Harshji told, I had, uh, this is one of the first talks I agreed to speak and I just the uh, uh, recall, you know, didn't happen and it was uh, sort of getting blocked. So the first point was, how is it at all possible to inquire without memory? That was only the uh, 
practical side of it. Anyway, so one of the things, in fact, forgetting or not trying to say what I've already jotted down, one of the things that occurred to me um, with, a, with a few uh, uh, questions and especially Rajaram was saying this, that I'm looking at, let's say is, okay, one of the questions is, is memory and knowledge different? This is one of the first things that occurred to me. And I, I in fact, said maybe both are uh, the opposite sides of the same coin. So uh, one could not say that uh, one exists without the other. Um, so one of the other things that I listened to was that the place of knowledge and memory and uh, Gopalan sir and the others, you know, went in quite detail about this memory as, you know, a part of the brain, part of the human being. And of course, the question of whether it exists inside or outside, that does not matter. But what occurred to me was that it looks like the brain and the memory are like hardware and the knowledge was like the software. And we are so much so interested in this uh, brain and memory. And actually, when we are dealing with computers and other things, maybe this is actually true. It exists. There is a hardware that exists. And hence, software is loaded. And then there is a function of that. But for us, what happens? So is one of the thoughts that occurred to me is, is this knowledge which I am acquiring, listening, uh, gathering, using, is this the one that actually keeps my memory the way it is? My conditioning, my inattention, all that. So there is nowhere one could alter your brain. There is no way one could alter one's, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, go and you can't do anything with the um, uh, brain as an organ. Maybe uh, you could do a little meditation and, you know, anyway, do all these things which sort of are uh, very temporary, take medicines and all that. But is my, is what I'm feeding to the brain the very essence of that memory, the very essence of that brain? So could one be alert or is that whole thing about one being alert to this day-to-day -day activities, the attention or the inattention that one does not carry. Is this the whole thing that shapes the memory and hence shapes your conditioning and hence, you know, the way we live our lives and um, we forget this. And, uh, you know, we are, though we read about it, though we hear about it, because we directly try to record it to the memory, then this memory is definitely not available at the instant that it is required. Let us say something happens very suddenly. This memory is definitely not there. It's because it's not, it's sequenced in a very different way. So probably this, uh, one of the things that I get out from the talk was that, is it to be alert uh, that, the whole thing finally depends on uh, what one is interested, what one wants. And even knowledge, for instance, I feel when we listen to Krishnaji and uh, when we have listened to a lot of other people, it is the knowledge that we store. But is there that extraordinary message? Is there that something extraordinary in that message which we can decode, which we can, you know, bring it out as not knowledge, but as something that could be possible, you know, to further, um, uh, you know, bring awareness or insight into our uh, uh, being. So I think it's too late and uh, rather quite a bit has been said. Thank you very, very much, sir. Thank you, Gopal and sir, for covering me. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Raviji, for the closing remarks. Uh, there is one more question coming from Mr. Arishankar Ayer. Uh, 
सुशील जी कैन वी अलाउ वन मोर क्वेश्चन प्लीज ओके सर ओके ओके सो मिस्टर अय्यर प्लीज अनम्यूट योरसेल्फ या गो अहेड नाउ या या यस सर सो दिस क्वेश्चन आई एम uh uh asking mr gopalan ji uh okay the way i understand the whole theme of this uh, today's discussion is that the limitation of uh, knowledge uh, okay the knowledge acquiring process uh okay though we start from uh, a clean slate over a period we keep accumulating lot of things and uh, the as per uh, when we start listening to krishnamurthy's teachings we are also shown the red flag Uh, when it comes to this accumulation process of the knowledge though we are thoroughly doing it we are also shown that this is the knowledge which ultimately ends up in being your conditioning okay knowingly or unknowingly the your content of your consciousness is this knowledge gathering process knowledge when i say it also includes the experiences and so many other things the mind activities okay uh i was also told that uh, even the uh, krishna ji is one of the discussions with the uh, david bohm on the ending of time is that the what is the ultimate uh, endeavor a human being uh, does on his quest for truth is to end the knowledge like what he said is ending of time the same way he is also talking about ending of knowledge per se uh, he used the word vedanta ending of knowledge anta okay so having said that now uh all along we were right from our student days and even now or even uh, this few years later we, we are looking for these kind of knowledge even reading krishnamurti is a kind of knowledge at some point it comes my, the, the my fundamental question and dilemma is if this knowledge has to be discarded for what it is to be uh, uh, to find the pathless land which is the truth then why do we even get into this knowledge uh, seeking at any time whatever you are going to get is also going to be limited uh, that we understand as we gather the knowledge we also understand that it is going to be more and more limited and a person who is uninitiated has not gathered the knowledge living in a simple uh, monastery or a uh, village he doesn't go through the cycle and then trying to empty it now we are all accumulating and parallelly watching it and trying to empty it so what is the difference one uh, has to comprehend between the uninitiated and the one who has initiated and is trying to empty that knowledge that is the content of the consciousness in the quest of the truth this is my question sir thank you i got your question see what we are really trying to do is to create an image we listen to krishna murti and then say ah there is this field on the other side how do i get there so we create a concept out of it so we are always working with concepts and working with words and therefore can we understand this fundamental way of working of the mind which says which starts acting and obscures the truth that is the negative approach the path of negation can i just be aware of the mind rising and clouding my insight again and again and again it comes back only to one that one truth there is an insight which comes from the life energy which is able to perceive and the mind rises in between and obscures that can i be aware of that rising and why it is rising what is that motive behind can i just continuously be aware and let the awareness have its own action can i experience this for myself i i just want to add to what mr gopal has mentioned krishna has never denied knowledge in fact if you see his life he was always surrounded by people who were highly intelligent you know and uh, academics people people who had a uh, name in the field of academics but he always tried to convey that you must know the limitations of knowledge unless you keep the knowledge in abeyance you can't reach that which is unknown so one has to one has to see that in that perspective i remember in the first and last freedom when aldous huxley had had conversation with him he says can you put your knowledge of botany behind and look at this flower that is the limitation because our knowledge always comes in the way of seeing things as they are that is the problem i think we can close at this one 
thank you mr gopalan mr kudli and mr uh, reddy i'm sorry i didn't uh, request you to come earlier and speak to us because i got confused with your name uh, but maybe some other time we'll when you are well we'll hear you again and once again i want to thank everybody for coming today thank you so much bye bye next next week announcement next week uh, announcement sir okay next week next we'll have, week announcement yes next week we'll have mr kiran kalap he'll be speaking to us his own experiences of uh, listening to krishni and coming and meeting him and so on so next week at the same time we'll hear mr kiran kalap he's in the field of uh, publishing and uh, publicity so we'll be hearing him next sunday same time thank you thank you thank you thank you to me very much thanks thank to everybody please close with sunday okay